We are in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20 today. And with this, we're going to see that, um, that Jesus told John to write a letter to the seven churches. It's kind of like what we learned a little bit yesterday, but it goes a little deeper into it today. And as we go through this study, which will take a long time, I think we have 116 questions on these 10 verses. Um, we're going to see that Jesus walks around in our church body. And that should encourage us, and that should also bring the fear of God into us. How are we living knowing that Jesus is walking around in our church body? Are our relationships right with each other? Are our relationships right with, with God? Are we living out what we say we believe? Or are we just offering lip service? Jesus is there watching. And so, we need to remember Jesus walks around in our church body. So, Trish, I'm going to have you read Revelation 1-9, please. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Thank you. So... What two things does John call himself? Brother. Brother and? Brother. Brother and partner. Okay. What is the first thing John is a brother and partner in? The tribulation. The tribulation. Is this the great tribulation? No. 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 So why is this not the Great Tribulation? This was persecution of the early church by the Roman... Yeah, was Domitian the was the emperor at the time. Okay. Yeah, Domitian. Uh, yeah, Randy, I'm going to have you go read Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 to 7. Jeremiah 30, 1 to 7. And... I thought, you know, because there's some, when you get to Revelation, people get really weird ideas because for some people it's, it's such a mysterious book. But what did I tell you last week, last two weeks? There's over 400 different biblical references in the book of Revelation. So Daniel chapter 30, Jer just right now, Jeremiah chapter 30. Verses 1 to 7, please. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now, these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale? Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Thank you, Randy. So... What two things will God do to Israel in verse 3? Restore the fortunes. Restore the fortunes of my people. Bring them back from captivity. Bring them back to the land from captivity. Very good. Was the land of Israel a sovereign nation at the time of John's writing of Revelation? No. no. It was ruled by Rome.
is there, according to verse 7, is there ever a time like this in all of history? No, none like it. None like it. Were the First and Second World Wars terrible? Yes. Okay. Was Israel a nation during the, the two world wars? No. Oh. What kind of tribulation is God talking about, Randy? Uh, is John talking about here in Revelation? Per persecution. Persecution. The church. That's right. So we have to differentiate between tribulation and great tribulation. So uh, we'll go back to Revelation 1.9, Susan. If you can read Revelation 1.9 again, because we've been back and forth a little bit. John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are that are ours in Jesus was the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Okay. So what is the second thing John is a brother and partner with? Kingdom. Kingdom. Okay. So, Ray, can you read Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, please? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of hell. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you. So what do those who are persecuted for righteousness sake get? The kingdom. The kingdom of? Heaven. Of heaven. Okay, so let's go back to Revelation 1.9. What is the third thing? What is the third thing John is a brother and partner in? Patient endurance. The patient endurance. Okay, Clay, can you read Romans 5, verses 3 to 5, please? We're all over tonight, aren't we, guys? <laughs> Romans 5, verses 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Thank you. So what does suffering produce? Endurance. And endurance produces? Character. And character produces? Hope. Hope. And what does hope do? Does not disappoint. Does not disappoint. Okay. Back to Revelation 1 9. Who. Are these three things in? Jesus. Oh. How can tribulation be in Jesus? He suffered. He suffered. But let's think about that. We, we don't think about, like, Jesus' love and joy and peace and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control. How can tribulation be in Jesus? He suffers when we suffer. Okay. 
He was persecuted. He was persecuted. You guys are having great answers tonight. Whose turn is today? Lisa, Daniel. I would like you to read Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Now, just to give you context, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The story of the fiery furnace. What's your Jason? Ma'am? What uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Okay, uh, then King, King Nebuchadnezzar was a star. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I found it. I okay. just was wondering how you knew this before. Like, is there somewhere that we have this information before we start? No. <laughs> okay. No. There's, there, there's not. There's okay. not. But what I'm doing right now, Jane, is I'm recording it. Okay. And if you want to go over it, I'll put it into the Telegram group. Perfect. And then you can go over it. So if you miss something, you can do that. Okay. Okay. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished as he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Thank you. How many men went into the furnace? Three. Three. How many men did Nebuchadnezzar see? Four. Now, let's look at this very clearly. Were they in Jesus or were they with Jesus? They were with him. So are they going through tribulation? Yes. So we need to ask that question again. I want to give you an Old Testament idea. They weren't in Jesus. They were with Jesus. Rob, John 17, 20, please. I don't know if you guys have heard me say this, but theology is like math. Okay? If you are in high school arithmetic, uh, high school math or calculus or university math or calculus, what does your professor tell you to do on any test? Show your work. Same in theology. You have tough questions, you need to study, you just can't come out willy-nilly and say this is the answer. You might be right, but show your work. Treat theology like calculus, okay? Or maybe not that far down, maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe just regular algebra. Okay, go ahead, Rob. 1720? Yeah. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Did I miss something here? 1720, that's not that's something else. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. No. You said John? John 1720. Yeah. Now you're in 17. <laughs> Are you reading from the Apocrypha? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, keep on reading. Uh, 1720 to 21. <clears throat> I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may, be, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Thank you. What three things did Jesus ask the Father? Now remember, before we answer this, this is known as the high priestly prayer. This is the second longest prayed prayer 
in the Bible outside of the book of Daniel. Jesus was praying this the night he was arrested, right before he was arrested. So this is important. What three things did he ask the Father? We'd be, you'd be, we'd be, Jesus would be in me, in us. Yeah. And in you. And then, um, and they may also be in us so that the world may believe. That's right. Again, that we all may be one. That we all may be one. What's another word for one? Unity. Unity. Okay. So again, how can tribulation be in Jesus. And this is what I wrote down after showing all this work. When we are persecuted, ours is the kingdom showing us we belong to Christ. We are in Christ. And therefore, persecution brings what? Unity. Let's go back to Revelation 1 9. We're still in the first verse, eh? Okay, Tracy. Uh, can you read Revelation 1 9 again, please, Tracy? I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Thank you. So where was John? Patmos. Patmos. And what were the two reasons he was on Patmos? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So... Read Revelation 1.10, please, Stacey. We're finally out of 1.9. Only 24 questions in. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Thank you. So who was John in? In the Spirit. In the Spirit. Remember what Jesus just prayed? I and you, you and me, us and them, them and us. Ooh. What day of the week was he in the spirit? Lord's the Lord's Day. What day of the week is that? Sunday. Christ. Sunday. Why is it Sunday? You guys know? First day of the week. First day after the... Uh, for the, 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 the day of the resurrection. The Sabbath is Saturday. Lord's Day is Sunday. Very good. Who else was he in, in verse 9? Go back to verse 9. Who else was he in? We just talked. We spent 25 questions talking about it. Jesus. Jesus. So he's in Jesus, and he's in the Holy Spirit. Is Jesus' prayer coming true from John 17? And what was John doing? So if he's with, I would say he's worshiping. He's worshiping. I, I put down he's fellowshipping with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Remember last week, he said that church history tells us before he went to Patmos, Domitian tried to have him boiled alive in hot oil. And now he's on this cold, 
humid, cold, windy, rocky island where you can imagine how his feet might have had third degree burns and his skin is can't sweat anymore because the sweat glands are gone. And maybe he's crippled up because he's an old man. And he is worshiping and fellowshipping with Jesus in a very intimate time. What, what did John hear? Is that what he says? Heard a voice? A voice like a trumpet. Okay, Jane, Revelation 1.11, please. Okay. okay, so the trumpet, which said... Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Uh, I'm not going to try to say uh, I'll, I'll do it for you. Uh, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Very good. Very good. So what was John supposed to write? What he sees. What he sees. What was he to write it in? Scroll. Does yours say a scroll? Mm -hmm. Okay, mine says a book. Mine says a book. Okay, so either a book or a scroll. Okay. Who was he to send the book to? The seven churches. The seven churches. And what were the names of the seven churches? Yeah, Smyrna. Pergamum. Yeah. Thyatira. 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 Sardis. 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 Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And Laodicea. Very good. My turn. 112. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. We're going to spend a lot of time here. What did John do? Turned. He turned to see, the voice. to see the voice. Why did he turn to see the voice? To see who was speaking to him. And why? Got it. He's been commanded. Write down what you see. Because before that, it's only what he heard. He would... Do you guys see the... Specificity? Specif yeah. I, I can't even say it. Specificity. And... Almost, can I say it like this? Militant obedience. Like snap to attention, I'll do it now. Of John. Not, uh, okay, I'll think about it. Let me have a coffee and I'll get to it. Right now. What did John see? Seven golden lampstands. Okay, Trish. Exodus 
chapter 25, verses 31 to 37. 25, 25, 31 to 37. Yeah, Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 to 37. Okay. The golden lampstand. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its cables, caxels, yeah. and the flowers shall be a one piece with it. To 37? Yeah. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it, three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blo blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, there should be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstands. Their calyxes and their branches shall be one piece with it, and the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up as to give light on the space in front of it. Thank you. So you know what a calyx is? A knob. Can I just ask how that's spelled? C-A-L-Y-X? Yeah. yeah. yeah my, my Bible says knob. Yeah. Different. So Different it's, to my understanding, it's the flower, the petal part of the flower. Mm. Okay. It says a bud. A bud, oh. yeah. Okay. I would have preferred that word. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, what were the lampstands? Yeah, what were the lampstands made of? What kind of what kind of gold? Pure. Pure hammered gold. How many candles on each lampstand? Trick question. Two. No. Nope. Seven. Seven. Three on one side, three on the other, and one in the middle. How many lampstands was Moses to build? Seven. 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 Randy? Exodus 40, verse 24, please. 40, 24. Remember when I told you over 400 references? 27? 24. 40, 24. He put the lampstand in the tabernacle of meeting across from the table on the north south, on the north side of the tabernacle. Uh, go, go to 25 also. And he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Thank you. Yours says north? Yeah, mine says south. Yeah, mine says south. side. Did I say north? Yeah. Oh. It's, mine says south as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you sure? You heard me properly? I heard yeah. so. It was a trick. I was just seeing if everybody was so Good job, though. And so, no, it's a very important, it's a very important thing that it's south. Because of how the tabernacle was set up. Yeah. Because that would, the tabernacle set up like a cross. Mm. And the south side would be the base of the cross. Kind of interesting. That's just a, just a side point. So, where were the lampstands supposed to be located? In the tabernacle. What part of the tabernacle? Before the Lord. Okay. And what part of the tabernacle or the temple is the Lord found in? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. The most holiest part. Okay, Susan, Revelation one thirteen, please. We're about a third of the way there, guys. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. Thank you. We're going to be all over the Old Testament, especially the law tonight. 
So, who was in the midst in the midst of the lampstands? Someone like the Son of Man. Someone like the Son of Man. Which Old Testament book calls him Son of Man? Daniel. Daniel and Ezekiel. Both. Yeah, Ezekiel. Both exilic prophets in the exile. And who calls himself the Son of Man in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So who is in the middle of the lampstands? Jesus. Jesus. How was his robe described? Reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash. Okay, anyone else is say just long? Long. Long. Yeah. And what version do you have, Sue? I have the David Jeremiah study Bible. Okay, so the heresy. No, sorry. It's NIV. (laughs) NIV. Okay, so I'm glad that you said that. Rob, what do you have? What what translation? Oh, this is ESV. ESV, okay. So we're just going to take a little rabbit trail here. There are three types of ways, three different ways to translate the Bible. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is one of those ways where the NIV takes artistic license and runs with it. So you have a word for word translation, a thought for thought translation, and a paraphrase. Okay. Word for word translation is the translators get together and they translate as well as they can from the original language into English to make it make the most grammatical sense. Okay. A thought for thought translation. So, sorry, a word for word would be like the King James, New King James, the ESV, the North uh, New American Standard Version. Okay. A thought-for-thought translation is where they take what they think the meaning of the passage is and they try to make it more culturally understandable. Okay? So, what they'll do is they'll take these idioms that we don't understand. Do you guys know what an idiom is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't, an idiom is like straight from the horse's mouth, okay? We know that we heard it right from the person. But what they'll do is they'll translate those idioms for us so we can understand. That's a thought for thought. And then you have a paraphrase, like the Darby translation, or um, if you guys don't know who Darby is, Darby's the guy that really fit pre-trib eschatology together, okay? Back in the 1800s, he has his own translation. Uh, The Message by Eugene Peterson. That would be a paraphrase, okay? Um, More thought for thought. I'm I'm not saying they're bad Bibles, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you the different ways that they're translated. So because of where we're going here, it's going to make a lot more sense if you get it from a word-for-word translation. Okay, so the NIV or the New Living Translation, things like that, that would be a thought for thought. Okay, so in a ESV or New King James or King James, how long was the robe? Down to his feet. Long. 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 Nasby doesn't use that. Nasby sucks. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm saying that because... It says long. Like, nasty is word yeah, for word. It's word for word. Yeah. yeah. Let's go to... Is there a different word in Greek for, like, son of man? But when it's clear, I mean, this I is don't... obviously talking about Jesus in this part. Mm-hmm. But in Ezekiel, he's taught he himself is referred to son of man yeah. a lot. So he is. Is there a difference between the... I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um, whose turn is it? Mm-hmm. Yours? Isaiah 6, 1, please. Just one, one thing, Clay. Yeah. You can you can go online, and you can ask to see 
the Greek and the English at the same at the same time yeah. of, any, of any verse? So uh, if you want, Clay, you can actually download Logos Bible software onto your phone, and you can. I think there's a free version. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Isaiah six one. I think there's a free version. Can you want to be here? No. Yep. Okay. No, it's just interesting how. Say it's obvious in this case, but there's so mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. It says in here yeah. that Ezekiel was referred to the Son of Man ninety three times. Mm -hmm. So it seems like quite a common phrase. Is that the MacArthur? Uh, no, this is the um, the Crossway ESV. Okay. Go ahead. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Thank you. So what was unique about the Lord's robe in 6.1? It filled the temple. It filled the temple. Um, would that be a long robe? Okay. It's a long robe. Long and wide. Long and wide. What does his long robe uh, signify? Do you guys know? I preached a sermon on this one time. His immense glory, honor, and majesty. Oh, you're reading for the notes, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's what it means. At that time, the length of a king's robe determined how much honor, and glory, and majesty you had. His robe in Isaiah filled the temple, signifying he has exponentially more glory, honor, majesty, and power than any earthly king could ever come close to. Back to Revelation 113, please. Clay? Uh, um, uh, 113, okay, I thought we just asked, but okay. Yeah. Um, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with the golden sash around his chest. Thank you. What was around his chest? Golden sash. A golden sash. So why around his chest and not his waist? Something to do with his heart. Yeah. I'm just, I can't back it up. <laughs> I can't say that now. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lisa, let's go back to Exodus 39, 1 and 2. Thirty-nine, one and two. Of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for the ministering in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. Thank you. Well, you can still you read verse 3 too. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it within the blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen into artistic designs. Thank you. So this is the ephod. The ephod is kind of like a ceremonial vest. Vest goes where? On the chest. What's the very first color in the vest? Gold. Gold. Then what do they hammer out? Gold. And what do they do with that gold? They cut it up and they wove it through the other colors. So what is the most observable color here? Gold. Gold. And who was this made for? For Aaron. For Aaron. And we looked at that. And we looked at that. So what is this? So who is Aaron? Do you guys remember who Aaron is? Moses. Brother. Moses' brother. And what was Aaron's high pr uh, his position? High priest. high priest. So what are the robe, that long robe, and this golden sash... Signifying about him. 
about Jesus? What's it telling us about Jesus? High priest and king. You see all this imagery here? It's not spooky stuff. John is using language that people who know their Bible would understand. Whose turn is it? Rob, uh, Revelation 1.14, please. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Oh, boy. What color was his hair? White. 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 And, yes. Michelle, how does John describe the whiteness of his hair? And, okay, white as snow, and he, he says two things here for white. Okay. Tracy, Isaiah 118, please. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Ooh. So what will the Lord do to our sins? Make them white as snow. And? and white wool. Oh. And what is the color of his hair in Revelation 114 telling us about Jesus. He's pure. He is a hundred percent pure. Sinless. Back to Revelation 114. What were his eyes like? Fire. Flames of fire. Like flames of fire. Uh, Stacy? Uh, Malachi 3, 2 to 3. If you guys don't know where Malachi is, turn to the book of Matthew and turn one book to the left. It's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 1. Chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify, purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Thank you. So what day is he talking about? The day of his coming. The day of his coming. Who's coming? Christ. Christ. What is the book of Revelation about? Revelation 1 1 tells us. Revealing Christ. The revealing Christ. Very good. So, what will he sit as? A smelter and purifier of silver. Yes. Mine says a refiner or, yeah, a smelter or a purifier as silver. How do you refine silver? Fire. What kind of silver will it be? Pure. Hundred percent pure silver. And who will he purify? Sons of Levi. Son <clears throat> Sons of Levi. What tribe do priests come from? Levi. 
What does 1 Peter 2.9 say about the church? We are a royal priesthood. Oh, isn't that interesting? Let's go back to 114, Revelation 114. So why are his eyes flames of fire? They're pure. They're pure. Um, who can read Proverbs 30, verse 17? And then, Jane, I'll have you go to Matthew 6, 22 and 23. And yeah, Trish, I'll have you read Ma uh, Proverbs 30, 17. Okay. Trish will go first. Ear wax is shot out and almost hit Susan. <laughs> I know it all. Who's it? Thirty. Thirty verse seventeen. Go ahead. I know my oh, I thought you were there. I'm sorry. My pages are stuck. Thirty verse seven. There we go. Okay. Verse seventeen. Seventeen. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. Keep reading. Oh. Three things are too wonderful for me. Four, I do not understand. The way of the eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a virgin. Okay, we're missing something here. Proverbs 30, verse 17. Why did I look, take a look? Because it was about the eye. Matthew is about the eye. Yeah, but I just want to let, take a look at this again. Okay, let's try 30, verse 7. No? Anyway, uh, the eye is the lamp to the soul is what it's supposed to say. Is it 20? Yeah, I don't know, but... Um, Totally screwed up on that one. Okay. Uh, and what does Matthew 6, 22 to 23 say, Jane? The eye is the lamp of the body. If oh. your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. Okay, just a sec here. I wrote down the wrong. It's Proverbs eleven thirty. I don't know how I've got 30, 17. Proverbs eleven thirty. I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. 30. The, the fruit of the righteous... The fruit, of, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. If the righteous... Is that it? Uh, I don't know what I did anymore. 1130? Yeah. Never mind. Keep on going, Jane. Okay. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. I let... Yeah, keep going. Sorry. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Okay, sorry for screwing up on that one, guys. But um, what is the eye? The light. The light to soul. the soul of your body. And so if he's got a refiner's fire in his eye, what does that tell you about his heart? 100% pure. pure. No sin. Saw it in his hair. Saw it in his eyes. Trish, can you read uh, Revelation 115, please? 115, okay. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. So what, what were his feet like? Burnished bronze. Okay, let's go back to Exodus. 38.2, please, Randy. I've got 38.1 and... Try 38.1 and 2. <laughs> you two are great. Yeah, 38.1 and 2. He made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length and five cubits its width. It was square and its height was three cubits. 
He made his horns on its four corners. The horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. Thank you. So what did he make the altar of burnt offering out of? No. Acacia wood. Acacia wood. What was the cross made out of? Acacia. No. Wood. Wood, okay. Yeah. Let's read uh, 38.2 again, Randy. He made its horns on its four corners. The horns were of one piece with it. And he overlaid it with bronze. Thank you. What did he overlay the altar with? Bronze. Bronze. Is bronze a strong or a weak alloy? Strong. 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 It's stronger than iron. It won't melt in a house fire. Yeah. How many metals make bronze? Copper and nickel? Copper and tin. tin. So two of them. So what does this show us? Three and one. I got, I have, yeah, exactly. Um, I actually have two. Oh. But if it's copper, tin. That's right. So showing that Jesus is fully God, fully man. And so now we see fully God, fully man. We've got pure hair, sinless Pure eyes showing sinless soul. Two metals around, making one metal around the altar where you put the offering, which will not burn. Showing fully God, fully man. What do we use feet for? To walk. So let's go back to Revelation 115. Walk in a way, in a manner worthy of Christ. Walk this way. Uh, yeah, Sue, if you can read Revelation 115. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Thank you. What was his voice like? The sound of rushing waters. Okay. Ray, can you read Psalm 93, please? The whole psalm. Read the whole psalm, Ray. We'll be here like 30 minutes. It's a short psalm, Ray. Psalm 93. It's a whole eight verses. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The word is firmly established. It cannot be moved. His throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder, of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house. For endless days, O oh Lord. Thank you. So what is the sound of his voice greater than? than the great waters and the roaring seas. Revelation 1.16, please, Clay. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Thank you. What was in his right hand? Seven stars. Seven stars. What came out of his mouth? A sharp two-edged sword. Lisa, Hebrews 4.12, please. Oh, 
Hebrews 4.12. You guys are getting a workout. You guys have calluses on your fingers by the end of the night. For the, word, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Thank you. So what is the word of God sharper than? Sword to rest. And Lisa, what does it do? It uh, pierces even into the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And, and it discerns your thoughts and intents of your heart. Okay. Let's put this together. Turns around. Told to write down what he sees. White hair, white like wool, white like snow. Sinlessness. From Isaiah. Eyes of fire showing a pure heart, pure soul, no sin. There's no dross in here. It's pure silver. Feet of bronze. The two in one. Indestructible. That is on the altar. And now the word of God coming out. And what does it do? What's the last thing it says, Lisa? It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you see this? And remember, what's the main part of this Bible study? Jesus walks around in our churches. In our, bo in our body, just not in our church building, in our, in our groups. And it's discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. And he is 100% pure sinlessness, 100% pure righteousness, the indestructible two in one that always walks in truth. Back to Revelation 1.16. Whose turn is it? Rob. Oh. Yeah, okay. Rob, 1.16, please. Yeah. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Great. What was his face like? Sun. Sun like what? Shine. Okay, back to Exodus thirty-four twenty-nine. Tracy, can you read Exodus thirty-four twenty-nine for us, please? It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of, of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. Yeah, speaking with God is, is the him. Okay. So what was unique about Moses' face? He was radiant. He was radiant. It shone. And if you read down further, people were scared of him because his face was so bright. It wasn't like he had a happy glow on. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, if he was a female and had that pregnancy glow. No. It was blinding bright and if you know the story he had to wear a veil because it scared people so bad why did his face shine according to this because he's speaking with the lord what was mentioned about jesus right before his face shining in revelation 1 16 Two-edged sword. And what does the sword represent? The word of God. The word of God. So why is Christ's 
face shining like the sun. Just because he's speaking to the God. Because he's speaking the word of God. 100% sinless perfection in the hair. The eyes show the 100% purity of his soul and heart. The burnished bronze show the two in one on the altar. His feet show the lifestyle. This is how he is. The word of God comes out. And because the word of God comes out of who he is, his face shines brighter than the sun. Are you guys starting to see who Jesus is? He just isn't some religious guy that was nailed to a cross. This is the one who was nailed to the cross. Whose turn is it? It's me. Okay, uh, ver uh, Revelation 1, 17 and 18, please. Now when I saw him, I fell at, at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Verse 18. And the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Thank you. What did John do when he saw Jesus? Fell down dead. as dead. Was John moving? You have a little itch behind his ear, and oh, I gotta get this. Mm -hmm. Is he petrified? Mm -hmm. Are you guys starting to see a little bit more of who Jesus is? What did Jesus do when John fell? On his feet. Oh, sorry. Yeah, fell on, on Christ's feet. Placed his right hand on him. Okay. What hand did Jesus lay on him? The right one. Right. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus have to take out of his right hand in order to put his hand on John? Seven stars. Seven stars. It doesn't say he put him down. So they must be in his left hand now. That's very important. He put his right hand on John. What does this tell us about the love that Jesus has for John? Whatever these seven stars represent... We're going to figure it out here soon. He took out of his right hand and put in his left hand. Because it doesn't say he put him down. And there's a huge theological error if he put these down. So they must be in his left hand. And he placed his right hand on John. And what did he say? Fear not. What does this tell us about Christ's love for John? Yeah. What did Jesus tell John not to do? Do not, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why did Je uh, who did Jesus say he was? The first and the last. And the living one. And the living one. What did Jesus do? Right after the living one. Well, he 
He died. I died. But he's still alive forever. That's right. What is Jesus forever? He's alive forever. Behold, I died. I'm alive forever. I hope that you guys are seeing a deeper reality of who Jesus is. What two things does Jesus have the keys to? Death and Hades. Death and Hades. What's the difference between death and Hades? Do you guys know? Hades is a living place, isn't it? Kinda. De uh, kinda. Death would be the grave. Okay? Death, you're in the ground. Death is the opposite of life. I have the keys, meaning I can unlock death. If I can unlock death, what does that make death? No longer conquered. Conquered? What's the opposite of death? Life. Life. If a lock is locked, it's closed. If it's unlocked, it's open. If you unlock death, you now have life. And Hades. Hades is where the dead reside. The ones waiting for judgment. So the way okay. to... I mean, this is just a thought that came to me. I mean, death and Hades, death would be the body. Hades would be a spiritual... 100%. 100%, Randy. I'll never hear the end of it now. <laughs> journal that. Just journal it. Oh, heaven forbid I'm going to have a rough week. On September 22nd, Randy was right. Uh, who's reading? Jane. Jane? Uh, 119, please. Great. Therefore, what you have seen... What is now and what will take place later? Thank you. What did Jesus tell John to do? To write. To write. What three things did he tell him to write? Sorry, there are three things he told him to write. What are they? Things he has seen. Things that are... Yeah, have, yeah, things that he has seen, those that are, and those that are to take place. When is this, quote unquote, this? When it says that those that are to take place after this, when is this? Now. Now! Very good. See, it's not that hard. When you slow it down and read it, it's not that hard. Okay, Trish, 120, please. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you. So what are the seven stars? Seven churches. Nope. Uh, is it, does it say pastors? No, that's what it, it's the messengers. Messengers. Yeah, it says angels, right? Yeah. And the, the definition of an angel is a messenger. Right? What does angel mean? Messenger. Okay. Randy, okay. Daniel 12, 3, please. <laughs> Ooh, we're about to get into some really good stuff now. If it hasn't been good already, hope you guys aren't bored. There you go. Uh, Daniel 12, 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteous, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Thank you. What will those who turn many to righteousness look like? 
like, like stars. So how do you turn many to righteousness? Witness. Share the gospel. Witness. Share the gospel. Why was Paul at Patmos? On account of the word? On account of the witness and the word. Is the gospel a message? Yes. Yes. And what is Jesus holding in his right hand? The seven stars. And where are his messengers found on the earth? In the church. In the church. And what are the seven golden lampstands? The, the seven churches. And where are... Are the seven golden lampstands originally found in the Bible? Asia. Close. What did you say? In the Asia. Bible. So what we read tonight in the Old Testament, where are the where are the seven for you? Deeper. That was a deeper answer. Yeah. You're too deep for me. Yeah, you can back it up. Where are the seven la- golden lampstands found in the scriptures that we read in Exodus? Oh, the what part of the tabernacle? Tent of meeting? Yeah, in the tent of meeting, like Holy of Holies area. Oh, do you see where Jesus is now? And who he's holding? Whose turn is it? Randy? Is it your turn? No. No, whose turn is it? Randy, you do it. Numbers 8, 1 to 3. Woo! I'm getting goosebumps. Uh, eight what? Verses one to three. Probably should have been Susan, but I'll, I'll do it for her. Okay. <laughs> and and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him. When you arrange the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He arranged the lamps to face toward the front of the lampstand, as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay. Thank you. Where were the seven lamps to give light? In the front of them. In the front of what? The lampstand. Therefore, where is the lampstand? In the Holy of Holies. Okay. Where were the seven lampstands supposed to be? Just across from the tabernacle. Well, no, like, what does this say in numbers? Oh. Show our work. In front. In front. Yes. So where is the singular lampstand? In the center. No, behind if they're him. in the front, behind him. Behind, him. Okay. behind the seven lampstands. Since the seven lamps, since the since the lampstand is behind the seven lampstands, and the seven lampstands are the churches, what does this tell us? It's Christ that illuminates the, the lampstands we, in the church. We are the light of the world. That prepares people for Jesus. The church is first, and then Jesus comes. This is the revealing of Jesus. That's what Revelation is about. Mm-hmm. Now, Susan, just look at the heading on mm-hmm. chapter 9 of Numbers. What's the heading? The Passover. Oh, thank you. How many Passovers have been celebrated before this one? Do you guys know? One. One. So this is the <coughs> second Passover. What does the Passover foreshadow? Do you guys know? Well, the death of Jesus on the cross. Yeah. Okay. 
So what is this telling us about the church? We have the first Passover, which is the death of Jesus on the cross. We now have the seven churches in the Holy of Holies in front of Jesus. And then we have the second Passover. What's this telling us about the church? Number one, we proclaim Christ. That's what we do. We are the messengers. The churches are the lampstands. But who's Jesus holding in his right hand? Not the churches, the, the messengers. You notice when Jesus put his right hand on Paul, uh, on Paul and John, it doesn't say he put the, the stars down, so he must have put the stars in the left hand. Meaning, when Jesus grabs a hold of you, he's not letting you go. He's not. But what are the seven stars? Messengers. Remember what we talked about last, last week? Are you a messenger? Or are you just an attender? Let me put it this way. Clay and Lisa came out to the campground. Well, to the golf course out in Waterton. Clay is a much better golfer than I am. Much better. Lisa, was this, how long have you been golfing? A couple months. A couple months. Okay. <laughs> She's doing fantastic for a couple months. I'm going to toot my own horn. I'm going to say I'm a little bit better than Lisa. But here's the thing. Clay's really good at golf. I'm okay at golf. I enjoy it. I'm okay. Lisa, you can tell Lisa enjoys golf. And she'll really enjoy golf next year even more. Because she'll get better at it. Right? On track less than you. Yeah. But you see what I'm saying? I understand I have the gift of evangelism. You guys aren't going to be preaching to two or 3,000 people a month. I get it. I understand that. And I'm not saying that you've you, you got to be Wayne Gretzky in evangelism. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying at the same time, your life needs to be revolved around the message and the witness. Was the church always part of God's plan? Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to show you this. First Passover. Jesus Christ. Seven churches. Proclaiming Christ. And what comes next? Why did God put it just like that? The second coming of Jesus Christ right after that. If you look what's in between, I got so excited I didn't write the rest of it. After this is the consecration of the priests. After this lampstand placement is the consecration of the priests. The church needs to get out of the way before Jesus returns. Yay. It's really kind of interesting. But that doesn't happen until Revelation 4. It's just foreshadowing. Foreshadowing Revelation 4. So conclusion. Number one. Persecution will prove we are kingdom worthy 
and Christ will give us endurance to persevere through it. Number two, being a faithful witness and preaching the gospel will bring persecution. Number three, persecution unifies the church. Number four, we have fellowship with Christ and the Holy Spirit because we are in them and in Him. I don't know how to say it because three in one. Mm -hmm. The church is in the throne room of God. The seven lampstands. That's why Paul says we can boldly walk into the throne room of grace because we're already there. We're one of the seven lampstands. Number six. Jesus is the pure high priest who made atonement for our sins according to the word of God. Number seven. Jesus holds his messengers in his right hand. Number eight. Jesus holds us and he can tell us not to fear. Because he holds us. Number nine. The church was always part of God's plan. And number 10. Jesus walks around in the church. Are we loving? Are we loving in a are we living in a way that will please him? Who would like to pray for us tonight?